What's growing on, gardeners? For a change, I'm not coming to you from the southeastern coast of North Carolina. I'm coming to you live from Jersey. I am in James Prigioni's yard, and today I'm going to show you what he has growing on. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon store and spread shop links in the video description for everything I use in my garden and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. Everything is starting to come to life for spring and the gardens are beginning to look incredible. I can't wait to find out how he has done this and made this all possible over the years. So on tonight's episode of 60 Minutes, I will be interviewing <laughs> garden mastermind James Prigioni. In, in the flesh. In New Jersey, <laughs> very well-known avid gardener. And uh, I'm originally from New Jersey, was born and raised here most of my life, but I haven't been back in a while. So I wanted to take this opportunity to visit some family, to also pop in and visit James and see what he's got growing on. Yeah, it's just an excuse. He didn't have to visit family. He's just, he wanted to see the food forest, I I'm, think. I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> here to see at least one person. <laughs> but I have had some questions that I've always wanted to ask him because I've been personally a longtime subscriber of his channel. I've been subscribed to you for probably about three or four years and okay. I've watched a lot of your videos. And there's some things that I've always wanted to ask you and I thought maybe the viewers would want to know a few things about James and mm. who you really are and what has gotten you into this whole gardening world that you see? So my very first question for you is, are you originally from New Jersey? Yep, originally from Jersey, born and raised. I actually grew up in the house only a few blocks from where I live now. So not only am I born and raised in Jersey, but I haven't ventured too far from, from the, where I'm at now. So I definitely have my roots in this section. So how old are you? How old am I? That's next question. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I am, hold on, let me count it up. It, I am 35, 35. I was born in 89, so. 89, 35. That means I'm older than you. Yeah, but I might be wiser than you. That's, that's, that's not a big lift. That's not a heavy lift. <laughs> I wouldn't go bragging about that. But the real question is, how old are you when you started gardening originally? That is a good question. So, I started making videos I think in 2012 and I and I was about around there so 2011 so 13 or 14 years probably I, I started gardening I started make gardening and making videos at a very similar time and uh, because of some of the things that I was inspired by which led me to into gardening and then also in the same vein led me into making videos too so so you picked it up in your early 20s yeah well what got you into gardening well I was like getting at around the college time and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do and I was I mean like a lot of us I was watching Netflix I found a documentary called Fresh and uh, Joel Salatin was in it and this is the first time I was introduced to Joel Salatin or, or, or this whole idea of homesteading and he really captivated me in that documentary and then I started reading his books. I read one of his books, You Can Farm, and then another one, he had a couple others, Pastured Poultry Prophet, I think it was called, about raising chickens. And then within his book, in the, he would reference in the book, You Can Farm, Bill Mollison and Permaculture. And that was one of the things that inspired him. So then after reading a few of his books, I checked the index of his book, and then I found the books that he said people should read. And then Bill Mollison was in there and permaculture was in there. And then I found permaculture. After that, I went onto YouTube, researched permaculture, and then everything just kind of cascaded after that. So you didn't grow up in a family of gardeners. This was just something that you stumbled across and it just captured your heart? Pretty much, yeah. That is, that is, that's different. That is different. <laughs> yep. Well, that I mean, is... it, I don't like to grow normal. I don't like to get into growing normal. Well, that's I've got my, to keep it a little That's odd. my next question because <laughs> Most people, when they, when they get into gardening, they set up a garden. They have a traditional plotted vegetable garden. You have taken a completely <laughs> different approach and you've transformed your entire yard into this, this hybrid, like a forest with a garden growing inside of it. So what made you go for this style of gardening and not the typical style that most of us are familiar with? Well, it was definitely this, I guess because my first love through gardening came from permaculture. And, and when I got into permaculture, it wasn't just gardening. I liked the whole aspect of it, but then one of the important components of permaculture is gardening. So then after like knowing that I wanted to, I, I mean, try some permaculture stuff, I tried gardening and then that's what I really fell in love with, just that idea of gardening. So 
most gardeners, the first thing they do is go to like Home Depot or Lowe's or a big box store, get a few tomato plants and then put that in the ground. Mine was like, go to the, go and get fruit trees and put fruit trees in first. So I kind of started like a little differently. And then after I put my fruit trees in, because that old saying, you know, the best time to plant a fruit tree is, is seven years ago, the second best time today. So I was like, let me get my perennials in first. I put the fruit trees in and then I started to incorporate like annual planting. And then I, I mean, it took me a few years to even get into raised beds. And then I just decided that it could be really cool if you could have a food forest garden and apply those principles of like a larger scale garden, but then also do like a smaller scale garden, like raised beds. And just the combination of the two allows me to just, like you said, have a hybrid form of gardening, which I feel like I can get a lot out of the space that I have. So then what would you say to the new gardener that hasn't done anything yet, or maybe is just in the very <laughs> entry stages, where should they begin? Start small, <laughs> smaller than what I did. I wouldn't start with fruit trees necessarily because a lot of the original fruit trees that I put in, I ended up taking some of those out because I didn't get the best varieties. I went to like Home Depot or Lowe's and just got like $5 trees they had on sale. And there's one or two that I got that I still have, but the majority of them I replaced with good disease resistant varieties to make it easier and also stuff that I wanted to eat. So for a new gardener, I would say start small, start slow and get a few harvests under your belt and then that will encourage you to continue gardening because the worst thing is you could do too much the first year it becomes overwhelming and then you don't want to do it the next year so what would you recommend the, the new gardener actually focus on annuals perennials or a mixture of both i would say a mixture of both but i would stay to simple ones like like definitely grow things that you like to eat tomatoes cucumbers peppers try those but then do some annuals that are relatively easy like strawberries i consider those to be I mean, a perennial, a perennial that's easy, like strawberries, I consider a good one because it's pretty easy and everyone loves them. And it tastes even better when you do it yourself. And then even raspberries isn't a bad option. And depending where you live, blueberries. But I would, I would say fruit trees are more of a intermediate or like a, they're definitely a harder thing to grow and to get fruit from as opposed to an annual. What do you think about the importance of root stock to a fruit tree? Oh my gosh, that's massive. Good rootstock makes a big difference and also good disease resistant varieties. So you might end up paying a little bit more for a good for ordering a bare root tree with a good rootstock, but it will pay for you in the future. That's what I like to say about perennials. It's like annuals, you have to put a lot of work into them and you get a lot back. But perennials, you do your research, you put a little money, you invest in them, and then they'll pay you back in the future. So they kind of work for you. One of the things, I don't have anything inherently against the big box stores, and sometimes they do get some good varieties in, but they don't tag the root stocks. Yep. And I, I'm always worried, for me, since I'm only growing in a suburban lot just like you, having a small root stock, a dwarfing tree, is really important because you don't want to plant one tree and have it take over a quarter of your entire yard. Exactly. And I've also found that dwarf trees, I end up getting bigger harvest from dwarf trees than semi-dwarf trees because they're easier to manage. So I have to like spray my fruit trees with surround kale and clay. It's like a, it's like a natural cl clay, but it's super fine. I have to spray my trees. The dwarf trees are very easy to spray and manage. The big trees, it ends up being a lot of work. So even though the tree's smaller, the yield is actually bigger for me on some of the dwarfs. So here in New Jersey, what do you think are some of the easiest things to grow? Easiest things to grow? Oh, well, tomatoes are actually one of the easier things in New Jersey. We're known for our tomatoes. Another simple one would be blueberries. They grow wild around here. So the blueberries are easy, the strawberries are pretty easy, and the tomatoes are easy. When it comes down to it, there's not a lot of things that are hard to grow. It's just an understanding, like you know, of every plant there's like a little, a little thing that, need, that it needs, and every location is different. So, I mean, something like cabbages and cauliflower, the brassicas, I used to not get good harvest from them, but once I realized how to prevent the cabbage white butterfly from laying, eggs and then getting cabbage worms that unlocked my harvest so it's like everything there's a little trick to every little thing i was actually taken aback by how many apple trees you had here i had no idea how many you have seven eight nine trees oh probably i mean i like to grow what i like to eat and there's one thing that i'll that will never be extra and that's apples i can eat an apple every single day i think for the rest of my life and i would be happy so I grow a lot of apples back here. Do you think they're easy to grow? No, they're definitely not easy to grow. But I have found that there's some good varieties that, that do well for me. Like the Liberty apple, that's like known for being one of the most disease resistant apple trees on the planet. And it also tastes delicious. 
So that's one I like to grow. And then there's another one like the Williams Pride where it is ready so early. Like late July, early August, I'll start grabbing apples, which is unheard of because usually we don't get apples around here till like the end of September or October. So just something like the Williams Pride almost is easier in a way because there's less amount of time they have to protect the apple because it just fruits earlier. So then what do you say to all the gardeners out there that want to have a garden, but they think their yard is just too small? Uh, I, I'd say that's a poor excuse. I heard someone say, Excuse, <laughs> excuses are just well-planned lies. And I think, that, I think that's, that's kind of true when it comes to a garden. I mean, a patio garden is beautiful. You can have plenty of space to do that. There's the tower gardens. There are so many different ways to grow. I personally think uh, sometimes the gardeners who have smaller space end up being better gardeners because they need to utilize every square inch. So they, they need to get the most out of it. So, I mean, growing vertical is a great way to do it. And then there's so many space saving techniques to grow food. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to say you can't let space be a limiting factor when it comes to growing food. No, I, I agree fully. In fact, before I came here, I actually did a little Google Earth investigation <laughs> of your yard. And I found out that this entire growing area, everything you, you have minus the little lawn patch yeah. is about 8,000 square feet. So you have all of this growing in 8,000 square feet, which is what? less than a fifth of an acre yeah it's, it's and you're doing all this yep it's not that much i mean you don't need a lot and i have a lot of fruit trees that can take up space i mean they canopy over a lot of things but that i'll still grow things underneath that so one of the reasons i love the idea of the food forest was that there's this aspect of seven layers so i try to incorporate a lot of different food into each layer so when you can understand that some plants can grow next to each other and still thrive and do well then you can try to you don't all of a sudden have a fifth of an acre you multiply it times three then you have all that space because you have multiple plants growing in one single area. So it's one it's thing I do. noticed is that you have strawberries growing underneath all of your fruit trees. I think I may have to steal that idea from yep. you. Oh, it works brilliantly in my opinion. It's really nice. And I they love benefit doing it. from the shade because strawberries don't like it hot. So. Exactly. And then also like um, the strawberries will f a lot of times if you get the early varieties will finish. And then if you wanted to spray your tree like I do with the clay, it's okay if it drips down on the strawberry plants because you've already gotten the crop from them. And then it provides a layer of like living mulch for the tree so it works really nicely well now i kind of want to ask you a couple of fanboy questions okay. <laughs> since i'm a long time subscriber i know the answer to this now okay. since i've been here but a lot of the viewers may not who does your filming oh that one should should, should that be revealed no i'm just kidding yeah my my brother actually films for me he's been doing it for years so it's 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 not you know it's not just me doing it i have someone doing it with me, which I think makes a big difference. We try to incorporate this level of like, uh, almost not like a vlog style, but come, come along with us. Like I'm taking you through the garden and to give you a picture of what anyone could kind of do in their own backyard. So we've been filming together since the start. So I think we have a good level of chemistry where he'll do something, you know, he might lead me to a spot to go look at something. I might lead him to a spot. So there's like a level of knowing what the other person is going to think before they do it. And I think it, I think it helps make a little bit more engaging videos, I hope. So over the years, you've accumulated a lot of subscribers. This is kind of blown up, just totally blown up on you. Yeah. What, what was that like watching that happen? Um, I guess it's, it, 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 it can kind of be a, a slow burn. There's been bursts, but I had been making videos for a number of years before I started actually gaining a good level of following. And back in the day when we were making videos early on YouTube, we were just doing it, you know, we still are just for fun, just to share and try to build a community and encourage other people to do it. So it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it, but I don't attach any kind of anything to it. I just love doing it. And I think it's really awesome that there are a lot of other people who are passionate about gardening like I am and I think it's just like hands down you gardening probably in my opinion has the best community there's a lot of people who are encouraging a lot of the comments are generally nice so it's I'm really happy to be in a community where where it's just like there's a lot of feedback so it's just a it's a fun experience how's it made you feel emotionally knowing that there's that much support it feels it, it feels good but it I mean, it might sound odd, but it almost doesn't feel real because you don't ever get to shake hands with anyone. So yeah. it's just number on a screen sometimes. So it's nice when you come out or I get to meet some other people and it, and it feels more real. 
but sometimes it just doesn't feel, I mean, it just, it's funny, YouTube, like online world and, and world in real life could be two completely different things. So it's, there's a bit of uniqueness that comes with that. I'm sure you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's incredible to know, like you said, that there is that level of support out there. Anybody that I've ever interacted with, you bump in in real life, it's been, it, it's, people are very nice and they're very supportive and it's been, so I have a question for you. you going. Do people notice you when you go to like garden centers like Home Depot or Lowe's or something? Usually sometimes? people don't see me over the shelves. So <laughs> usually I'm able to do that. You know what? Uh, honestly, uh, not really in garden centers. Every now and again in grocery stores. <laughs> really? And always in the produce section. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, why are you here? Don't you grow everything? <laughs> yeah. um, not, not all throughout the winter. Unfortunately, I can't grow peppers throughout the winter and things like, I wish I could. Yeah. But, uh, and I have to get, you know, I have to get the staples for Dale. Absolutely. Dale eats a bag of carrots a week and I just can't grow that many. <laughs> yeah, he goes first. Tuck wood if I let him, but sometimes I got to keep him out. He was here earlier just a little bit ago and he saw Tuck just going through and eating up all this asparagus. He ate your whole row of asparagus. Exactly. So I so, hope you didn't want any. Yeah. I turn around and I look back and that's just, that's classic Tuck. But when you're the boss, you can do whatever you want essentially. So what are your future plans? Future plans? Well, I mean, to continue doing this as long as I can. I love gardening. I want to encourage people to grow more. So the, that's the ultimate goal. So, I mean, I guess wherever that takes me, essentially. Do you see yourself one day with a larger plot? Um, well, I would like to have a bigger piece of land for a reason other than needing more space. I think I have plenty of space in this lot that I'm in, but I think you could probably relate with this. It's very tricky to film when you have 15 neighbors. So, uh, there's always a lawnmower <laughs> or a leaf blower or a, a dog making the presence known or somebody flying over your head. <laughs> exactly. So I, I have a, about 10 or 12 neighbors right in the back. So to try to film on a weekend, is t it can get tough. So that's like the only reason I want bigger space so that I can just for better sound quality, which might not seem a lot to people watching, but it, I mean, you probably know, you can spend a good portion of time just waiting for some air space where it's clear so the audio is, is good. And then sometimes you take a 700 mile trip to film something and you get a 30 mile an hour windstorm and yeah. we do the best we can with the audio that we have. Yeah, he came in April where, where it could be a little, it's a shoulder season well, here. Well, I, so. I flew out when the storm left me and then I landed and the storm hit you. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> like you might've brought it with you, so. <laughs> maybe, maybe, it was, it was worse my way. But uh, now would you mind maybe taking me around and showing me some things? Because we never get to see your garden early in the spring when it's just starting to come to life. I know, let's do it. What's really blown my mind about your garden right here is that all of your apple trees are in bloom. I'm 600 miles south of yours and mine are just starting. I'm just shocked by how everything is alive already. Yep, it's, it's a little bit early, but we shouldn't, hopefully don't get a bad frost. We could potentially get a frost up till the 30th, but I think we'll be all right. This Williams Pride is opening and it's got gonna be loaded with flowers, as you can see. I'm really, really happy about this tree. It's probably my favorite tree. You're gonna have to thin One that baby. Yeah, I'm gonna have to thin, that's, <laughs> that's right. And then what is this? This, we've got a beach plum over here. This is a, Jersey beach plum, so it, sh it has little plums on it that I'm going to have to spray soon with the clay, but hoping to get a little decent harvest from this one. They're yellow. They look really cool when they're ripe. Then we have just these beds down here. A few things popping up. It's still super early in the season, so I don't really do a majority of my planting till a little later in April. And then I know this tree. This is definitely an Asian pear. Yep, yep. This is an Asian pear. This one was stacked with fruit last year, and we're hoping for another good year from it. And then on either side of it, we've got some blueberries because it's not Jersey unless you've got some blueberries growing. And of course, more apples. Gotta have apples. I mean, they, they store well, they taste fantastic. I never get sick of eating them. I love peaches too, I have a bunch of peaches, but you can only eat so many peaches in, in a row in my opinion. And are these all dwarf apples? This one is a dwarf, not all of them. The other one I showed you was semi-dwarf. So this, for the viewers out there that think you can't fit an apple tree, this isn't gonna get that much bigger than this, especially if you prune it annually. Yeah, it's, the, my honey crisp in there is even smaller. And that's probably my favorite apple tree in the whole yard. It's so productive and the apples taste amazing. 
And the, uh, the first thing that I notice here, now this is a dwarf apple and this is a semi-dwarf, right? Exactly, exactly. So this, will, this will give you a great comparison as to what the size difference is between the two for a backyard gardener and what you can fit. Yeah, this is the Honeycrisp, the one that's one of my favorites. It's so productive and the apples are so good, it's insane. And then this is the Liberty Apple, which is the super disease resistant variety. And I didn't do perfect shape on this one, but it still, still keeps a little bit of the, uh, the central leader and it produces a lot of fruit. You can see how much fruit we're gonna get just by the flowers. Yeah, the flowers are insane. Yeah, and the apples are so cool because you know, they're in the rose family. So th this one, the flowers smell so good on the apples when they're in full bloom. When they're fully bloom, it's amazing. Then we've got some strawberries that are just starting to set up. This is one of my favorite varieties, the shucks and strawberry. So this one is so good. And then if you come to the right and take a peek, we've got some of the brassicas that are gonna be going into the garden in not too long, setting up or hardening them off, which is super important around here. And then we've got some more beds and then the keyhole bed, but I gotta show you the, uh, the Rainier cherry. That's one of my favorite trees in the whole garden. Come this way. Let's take a look. This one is one of my favorites. Look at the size of that thing, it's a behemoth. And the cherry, it, it ends up working okay. It's so big, but uh, I'll let the cherries up top go to the birds because they gotta have theirs, you know? And then the lower ones, those are mine. And then is that a cherry next to it? Is that yep. a pollinator cherry? Yeah, no, this is just a different variety. I think this, this is the gold cherry. So this one's got a little bit of a different color. Wow. So yeah, it's not bad. And then over here, stuff is still just like waking up i this is it looks empty now but this is where i'll grow a lot of my tomatoes so this is kind of just like waiting for its time and then we've got a few more beds here rhubarb kicking up a little bit and then we've got some white champagne currants these are my favorite currants these are just starting to flower and then if you come this way we have the stella cherry this one's not as as sweet but it's still a really good tasting cherry overall and then of course the hazelnut the hazelnuts are massive yeah it's tough for me to actually i i get production on them but it's tough to actually get a taste of some of the nuts because the squirrels just go crazy on them i think i need a cat yeah i think it's about <laughs> time you get a few stray cats to take care of that problem and then we've got the multi-grafted pear and the tajuro on this side is my favorite one this is my favorite overall pear I've ever had was the Chijuro. This is a beautiful tree. They taste so good. And then the boss has his, his kind of little bar where he comes by and gets all of his snacks. He got the fresh asparagus here. So I've been noticing that a lot of your asparagus is missing their tops. Yeah, well, you know, it's tough to stop them. Sometimes once, he, once, once I point at something, he starts sniffing it out. Right on cue, he'll just show up and just start eating the tops of them. Right, Boyo? <laughs> he didn't want that one. He He's said, like, I'm nah. not performing for the camera right now. Ah, exactly. never mind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he can do whatever he wants. That's what happens when you're the boss. And then, of course, the grape arbor. This is one of my favorite features. Oh, the grapes, yep. I've grapes. always wanted to do something like this. It's fun, but it's, it, it, it is a lot of fun, but it's, it's definitely harder to manage, but it's fun. And I built it with just, uh, you know, old branches I found locally. So they're starting to rot a little bit, but I think it gives that that natural natural feel where it doesn't look like it's it, look, it blends in with the environment which i like and the best part is you can reach the top yep definitely <laughs> and but I, I don't know if you've seen the clips when they're hanging down i'm bumping into them hitting me in the face that makes they, one of us. <laughs> nice and low oh, this but is beautiful i, I like it this. overall and then the greenhouse built this a few years ago so this is where all the magic happens basically if you can see there's a bunch of plants just starting i've got some more mature tomato look at that tomato right there yeah we got some of the garden towers so soon all that will be into the garden and we'll be grabbing some harvests uh it's the most exciting time of the year uh, yeah exactly once i once june hits around here all that will actually be in here we'll be getting food from it so it's just it's a lot of work right now in preparation that leads to the big harvests just a couple months down the road. And this should show everybody what is possible in a basic suburban plot. 
So everybody, I hope you enjoyed this tour behind the scenes of James's yard and garden. One thing I wanted to mention before we go, James has his own line of raised beds now, and they're really nice. They're different than anything I've ever seen before. So if you're interested in supporting James, feel free to take a look at the things he's offering. I will place a link down in the video description in case you want to see what he's offering. And thanks a lot for the tour. I appreciate no problem, you dude. taking me around. I've thanks for coming out. Place. Yeah, me, don't talk, me and Tuck don't get too many visitors, so it's always fun to bring people around and show them the garden. And anyone who's out there, showing other people your gardens is always just something that we love to do, gardeners in general. We out? Yeah, I, I guess we can do it. Tuck and James, we'll be back at you again real soon. We all right, we had a lousy rain day all day, and I think Dale is really pent up. He's gonna really wanna go crazy, I think, with his toy. Ready? <coughs> oh, he's really revved up. Ready? And go, Dale. Go get it. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> oh, we're teasing him. Go, Dale. Whoa, how did you catch that? All right, Dale. We're going for real this time. <laughs> Oh, he's vicious. Come on, come on. All right, Dale, drop it. Very good. I know it's hard to drop it sometimes. Ready? Nice catch, buddy. <laughs>